Okay, so now I want to um, just put a finer point on these, um, uh, these understandings through a case of a caesarean section and the question of whether or not a caesarean section could be compelled. So consider a case of A, where A is a 27-year-old woman who is pregnant with her first child. During prior antenatal visits, the fetus was noted to be very large with an estimated birth weight of 4.4 kilograms, which is on, on the large side. Uh, and this poses some risks during pregnancy. Uh, the cesarean section was recommended by the care team, but A declines, um, stating she prefers to have a natural birth. She subsequently presents at term uh, to the hospital in active labor, and the fetus uh, begins to have heart rate, um, heart rate abnormalities, and this suggests a non-reassuring status. We already had the prior uh, situation of a very high um, expected birth weight, and again the care team strongly recommends uh, uh, an emergency cesarean section as natural birth would pose a very high risk to the fetus. But in this situation, A again declines, saving the, even though she's been told about these risks, these elevated risks uh, to herself, herself and the fetus, she believes uh, strongly in the importance of natural childbearing. Okay, so in this case, the care team may deem the cesarean section to be in both the patient and uh, the fetus's best interest, right? So I think there's no conflict of interest in this case, uh, but a cesarean section minimizes complications to the, to the mother, uh, as well as improving the chances that the baby will be born healthy. But this is in tension with A's autonomy, uh, specifically the right to bodily autonomy, the right to an individual to control uh, what happens to one's body. And this, is, this, this uh, right to bodily aut autonomy is reflected in the law, in the law specifically against battery, against unwanted touching, essentially, uh, including surgical techniques that are not wanted. Now, the care team might think that perhaps uh, one could get around this issue and promote the best interest of the patient, um, if it could, and, and compel a cesarean section, if A is deemed to lack mental capacity, perhaps due to the distress of the situation. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind and be careful in this uh, sort of move, because uh, a refusal of treatment, uh, of treatment even that is deemed to be in the patient's best interest, is not itself grounds for a lack of capacity. Indeed, one must generally presume a patient has capacity unless there's evidence otherwise, and refusal of the treatment is not itself evidence. But even if a capacity assessment is undertaken, and A is deemed to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to lack capacity, even in that circumstance, a compelled cesarean section might not be justifiable. To understand why, let's look back at the Mental Capacity Act, uh, which would uh, govern care in the case that A is deemed to lack capacity. And just as a reminder, uh, in the first instance, um, if A lacks capacity, uh, but this capacity is fluctuating or could be regained, then, um, that, then that attempt must be made to help the patient regain capacity. Uh, before uh, care is, is compelled on her behalf. But if that is not feasible, if it's deemed that, that capacity is not going to return uh, in time, that a decision needs to be made about the cesarean section, let's assume there's no lasting power of attorney for simplicity, um, then the team acts in the patient's best interest. But keep in mind that this is legally defined, and under the Mental Capacity Act, A's uh, past and present wishes and other factors that would influence her decision must be taken into account. And we have the past expressed uh, preference when the patient definitely had capacity uh, uh, to uh, have a natural childbearing, even with the risks presented. And we have a present wish, even though this is not decisive in the case that a patient lacks capacity, is something that must be taken seriously into consideration. In addition, beyond the law, beyond the Mental Capacity Act, uh, we should also consider the effects of a compelled cesarean section, including the necessity of restraints, perhaps, the effects of loss of trust by the patient on the, uh, on the care team, and indeed the fact that this is going to be um, perceived as a bodily violation by the patient, right? It's something that act, is acting against her will, even if she lacks capacity. These are, um, these are harms that could potentially accrue to the patient in terms of her dignity. And these are factors that might weigh against a cesarean section, even if it is seen uh, to maximize the best clinical outcomes in this case. So summing this case up, if A has capacity, as we should generally assume without evidence to the contrary, a cesarean could not be compelled uh, under the prevailing legal and prof uh, professional and ethical standards. Now, if A lacks capacity, in theory, there are circumstances in which a cesarean could be compelled, um, but this is not a straightforward calculation. And the best interest assessment under the law and under prevailing ethical standards um, is not straightforward. It needs to be carefully, um, carefully weighed up by the care team.